Okay, tonight we start, of course, our series in Joshua, so if you have your Bibles with you, and I trust you'll uh, do that on a regular basis, because uh, you always want to check the talking head behind the pulpit, uh, regardless of how sincere and genuine and studied and everything else that they may or may not be, they can still make mistakes. The Word of God, however, stands perfect and complete, and we can have uh, this tremendous level of confidence in the promises of God. Uh, the book of Joshua is a fascinating little book. It really is. It has all kinds of background to it. Um, but this is going to be a lot more interactive than what we've been doing the last several months due to the nature of the thing. What do you, uh, what, what, what's the highlight of the book of Joshua in your um, exposure to the book? Uh, what are the significant, what's a significant item or two that, you know, you may recall uh, from previous? Yes. I like the part where it says that not one thing of all the good promises that God gave Moses failed. When Joshua took the children in, God fulfilled everything. Okay. All right. Great. Others? Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. <laughs> he fit the battle of Jericho. Okay. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Or... In that case, almost a non-battle. We'll get there uh, in a few weeks. But yeah, it was a significant thing, wasn't it, Kathy? I he think. succeeded Moses. He succeeded Moses. Yes, he did. Uh, and of course, as we begin the book, that's a great place to start. It really is. In fact, if you're in the book of Joshua and you look at the preceding page, you'll find Deuteronomy chapter 34, which of course records the death of Moses. It, uh, and you find as the, the chapter goes through uh, that Moses went up from the plains of Moab to the very top of the highest mountain, uh, to the very top of Pisgah. Uh, and the God there showed him. Now, if you're not familiar with biblical geography, uh, what you have is the highest mountain uh, just, well, it, I'll just put it, if you know where Jericho is, you may or may not. Uh, but the southeast part uh, of the promised land uh, before you cross the Jordan River. If you're coming up out of Egypt, wandering around in the Negev down there, and then you eventually, coming up from the Red Sea area, uh, you wind up going almost due north from there where the wilderness wanderings were uh, for some 40 years. Uh, then as you go further north, then you will run in to the promised land. Uh, and God's design for them was to cross the Jordan River, uh, which was by at that point at flood stage, but more on that later on. Uh, and uh, during that time, of course, you had this incident right here, the death of Moses. Uh, Moses had been a phenomenal servant of God and had done all kinds of stuff, some of which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but God took him up to the very highest point where he could look across the Jordan River into the actual promised land itself. That promised land goes clear back to the time of Abraham, which would precede Moses by about 500 years, where God had promised Abraham's offspring. Uh, what was uh, going to occur when they went in and possessed the land that God even then, 500 years earlier, was preparing for them. So you have Moses being taken up there. He looks out over and there's a whole description of all kinds of Hebrew names and Hittite names and Amorite names and this ite and that ite. You get the idea of the people of the land and so forth, and he reiterates, God reiterates to Moses uh, that his time of ministry, his time on earth, his physical life is over, but that he, God, was going to fulfill his promises to the nation of Israel. Uh, and then Moses died, and God says he buried him. Verse 6, it's always fun to look at. Verse 5, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him in a valley. Uh, he, God, God, it's the only place I know of in Scripture that says God personally buried a human being. Uh, kind of a distinctive in itself. Okay? Uh, nobody knows for sure where it was. Uh, they know the general area. Uh, you know, and there's been 
various exploration attempts and et cetera, and even in modern times for doing this. Okay. It says in verse 7 that Moses was 120 years old, and he was, <coughs> he was still strong as a horse. He had all of his faculties together. He could run with the best of them, fight with the best of them, lead with the best of them. There was nothing that he didn't. He was a, still a man of strength and valor and had mental acumen and all kinds of other things that went with that. The children of Israel mourned him for 30 days. And then you have uh, something that if you're speeding ahead, you'll find some things that are very pertinent uh, to uh, the book of Moses, or book of Joshua as we begin. Somebody read verses 10, 11, and 12 of Deuteronomy 34 for us. Read it loud enough so that it will pick up on the, the audio so that you will be on the internet for all of eternity. Uh, so don't be self-conscious about that, though. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. Okay, thank you, Jack. It, uh, you know, so what you have there is a, I suppose, a summary, very concise summary of, without naming any specifics per se, uh, of uh, Moses' public ministry, so to speak, at least you know, in the light of his del deliverance of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. Now. Sometimes it's helpful, and I trust this will be, uh, to take a look at the dating system. Uh, you know, in almost every uh, Bible commentary, you're going to have stuff that starts out with author, date, theme, significant facts, blah, blah, blah. Some of which are helpful, and some of which these guys get paid by the word, so you can see that they're going to embellish as much as they can. Uh, but what you have is some distinctive because even in the scholastic world, the research world of biblical texts, sometimes people get uh, different opinions and come down in different camps and so forth. Let me tell you how this works. If you utilize absolute rock solid dating system, uh, what you find is in 1 Kings 6 1, that it tells us that the Israelites left Egypt uh, 490 years uh, before the fourth year of Solomon. Okay? That is before 966, because that is the principal dating point for much of the Old Testament chronology, because we know absolutely for certain when Solomon came to the throne and when he built when he started work on the temple, when the temple's completion and so forth. So you can nail that one right to the barn wall. You really can. Now, having said that, it says in his fourth year, Solomon, and it tells us what the date was and everything that goes with it. So you know from scripture that each one of Israel's kings, Saul, David, and then Solomon, had 40-year reigns. So you can begin to backdate you know, the reign when David came to the throne, when Solomon came to the throne, when Saul came to the throne. And then you have this 490-year date that comes from kings, and so you can backdate once again everything that goes with it. This means that the Exodus had a date of 1446 B.C. Okay. Uh, there are various, I'll say, more modernistic scholars uh, or so-called that put a date that is centuries off from that particular platform. But it, if according to scripture and paying attention to the scripture or the Jewish calendar and dating system, you can nail that down pretty tight. So the beginning of the conquest was 40 years, okay, after the wilderness wanderings, because they wandered in the wilderness for what amounted to 40 years. You can plus or minus a few months, but that's what it boils down to. That means that 
when Joshua uh, appears on the scene, so to speak, uh, what you have is 1406. Okay, pretty good. So far, so good. Uh, the evidence from Judges chapter 11, verse 26, confirms that Jephthah said the period of the conquest that he lived in, okay, was 300 years. It's found in the book of Judges. You add 140 years to cover from Jephthah to the fourth year of Solomon's reign because of the dating of the kings and everything that went with it. Uh, and what you have is a total of that 480 years, not 490, I misread the, the number, 480 years uh, from the time, the time bracket, from the time that Joshua's conquest until the time of the temple. Uh, the point here is, is not to confuse you or blow smoke or anything else. The, the point is to tell you how precisely dated the Old Testament is. Okay? Uh, yeah, we can nail it down if we find it relevant to do so. In most cases, it doesn't really matter because we're more interested in content than we are in human chronologies, uh, but sometimes it's helpful to understand that. Okay? Now, that means that by the time you get pretty much through the book of Joshua, uh, when the promised land on the, what they call the Trans-Sif, uh, you know, the Trans-Jordan compared to the Sif-Jordan, Trans on one side, Sif on, east and west, okay, which side of the Jordan is it? Uh, the Jordan River, the conquest of main part of that area would have pretty well been completed in 1399 or 1398 BC. Okay. You still impressed? I hope not. Uh, you know, because it's not really, again, all that amazingly significant. However, when you begin talking about the time frames and how God utilized the centuries, the decades, or whatever, uh, then it kind of gives you a, a better frame of reference to fit a lot of the other Old Testament books, especially Judges, because interior Judges has very little, except for Jephthah, doesn't really have any real hard uh, facts about how long a period that was. So you've got to figure out from the time of the and, and you got some other interesting dates. We know, for instance, how old Joshua was when he entered into the Promised Land. We know how long he fought, uh, you know, initially in the initial conquest and the succeeding conquest. We know how old he was when he died. All you got to do is look at the last chapter of the book. And so when you begin patching these things together, then you find that you have a very distinctive period for Joshua, Judges. You know, the whole period of Judges is pretty extensive. Okay? And then you get to Saul. And you begin to understand the flow of going from Judges to a monarchy. And then, of course, all the other problems that goes beyond this study. So you kind of have an idea, okay? Joshua, interesting guy. He really was. Uh, let's go back uh, just a little bit to, the, say, the book of Exodus. Okay? Take, keep your finger there in Joshua. We are going to do that, that first part. Exodus 32. Somebody read verse 17 for us. Exodus 32, 17. Let's get a, a, just a few just blips about who Joshua was. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. Okay. Context. Anybody know? Go ahead. You got study Bibles. Read the top of it. <laughs> Golden calf. Golden calf. Right. Oh. It, you know, Moses is up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. You know, second trip up there and everything, communing with God. And they have the whole golden calf, the drunken orgy, everything going on down, down on the flat. And it's significant for our study that Joshua is halfway up the mountain. Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights up there. Okay? Most of us don't recognize, so did Joshua. 
Now, he wasn't in, right in the top of the mountain. He was only halfway up. He wasn't in the cloud where the presence of God was. But what you get now uh, by, I suppose, connecting the dots humanly is Joshua went halfway up and then sat there and waited for Moses to come back down. Okay. So he was a significant part of Moses' life, even while Moses was in the process of delivering the people from Egypt and then uh, getting the Ten Commandments and everything that goes with it. Uh, somebody turn over to chapter 33 and read verse 11. Exodus 33, 11. And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Okay. Joshua was Moses' servant. Okay. Kind of his aide-de-camp, right-hand man, young protege, uh, perhaps somebody he was mentoring, uh, however you want to look at it. Okay. Everything that goes with it. How about Numbers 14? That's one you're more familiar with, probably, or at least the whole context. Numbers 14. Somebody read 6 through 10 for it. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. And give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us, fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Okay. Context? They, twelve spies. Yeah, the twelve spies. Uh, following the, those passages of Moses being on the mountain and everything else, then they spent six or eight weeks by the time they got to Kadesh Barnea, which was a little bit to the west of where they finally entered the land, and that was their original marked entry point to go in and seize the land, as any good commander does, and because God was involved, uh, 12 spies wound up going into the land to check it out and see what humanly they would have to face. Ten of them said, they're too big for us, they're too tough, we can't handle it. Joshua and Caleb, we'll talk about him later on in our study, uh, were the only two that said, this isn't a committee meeting. We don't give a rip about the majority vote here, okay? God said, it's our land. All we got to do is go in and seize it. Our part is to be obedient. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. If God be for us, who can be against us? And democracy won out. They took a vote, 10 to 2, and basically that is how it ended up. And the people, because of disbelief, wound up spending pretty much the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness, of which the adult population... Everybody who was 20 years old and up, except for Joshua and Caleb, wound up dying in the desert, which, as I mentioned before a couple of times, and you're probably bored with it because I had to do it, which means that if you work it out mathematically, for 360 days, a Jewish calendar year, you, there was a funeral in Israel every four hours for almost 40 years. Every time they buried somebody, it was a reminder of what unbelief does in the plan of God. The human failure. Okay. I mean, it had to have been a reminder. I mean, really, it, it did. And then after that, Kadesh Barnea, lack of faith. And could you imagine being Joshua or Caleb? I mean... Going to funeral after funeral after funeral to pay their respects and saying, you know, this guy didn't have to die out here in the bush. You know, we didn't have to put another one under a chunk of sagebrush today. You know, I mean, wow. You know, you talk about forbearance and long suffering. We never get a negative note. 
about Joshua or Caleb's attitude about spending almost 40 years burying people. Krista? I had read somewhere that had they been obedient, the trip really would have only taken about six days. To get on into the promised land, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'd have, they'd, have, they'd have been able to walk right into the thing because, you know, God would have taken care of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God's plan, though, but they had a nice crop of young soldiers when they started in. Yeah, well, <laughs> they all the you know, but when they, when they departed Egypt, you remember that it tells us in Exodus that they had 600,000 fighting men that were able to go into battle when they came across the Red Sea uh, with the, the miraculous parting of the waters. Uh, so yeah, mankind failed God. God didn't fail mankind. It, uh, you know, but they definitely had a new crop with maybe a, a little bit different incentive or motivation. Mm -hmm. After having watched their parents and grandparents die for the last 40 years, they said, yeah, we're ready to cross the Jordan now. We don't care how big they mm -hmm. are. You know, because we'd rather do that than die in the wilderness. So object lessons all over everywhere, huh? Okay. It uh, reasons, uh, I guess here, here's some things. It, uh, uh, what's the purpose? Let's digress for just a moment. The purpose of the book, we've actually already, already defined it. The purpose of the book. Okay. Partly it relates a portion of the history of God's people. But I think maybe the main thing is it would show us the faithfulness and the power of God. Yes, it is. See, most people, you know, would say at the surface level, going in and capturing the promised land. That's true, but that's only a portion of it from the human perspective. God had made very specific promises to Abraham 500 years before that he was going to give the offspring of Abraham, a particular part of the globe that we stand on, okay, the promised land. And he defined it between the rivers and between the great sea and so on and so forth. You can look that, all that up. In fact, we're going to talk about it a little bit later in the study, but you'll get the idea. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Were all these people in the land the descendants of Ishmael? No. Uh -uh. Where'd they come from? Well, most of them were ites. Well, I know. You know the ites? Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> start with Abraham. <laughs> yeah. No, there, there were all kinds of peoples by then that had, uh, what, disseminated across the earth from the time that Noah had landed. And then the, his three sons propagated the, the role of mankind throughout that, you know, the, well, these were descendants of those particular people. It, uh, yeah, so there were all kinds of various people groups. We call them ethnic groups today, different languages, different cultural systems. Uh, you know, and again, you've got all the, you know, Amorites and Haggaiites and Hittites and, and you know, on and on it goes. So there's a list of them, especially if you go back to Genesis 15, where you see the promise of getting the land and who was going to be there, and who they would have to remove. The point being is that Joshua, you know, is a human history of God fulfilling his promises to the nation of Israel about the promised land. It's not just capturing a hunk of territory by the Jewish people. This is God bringing to fulfillment his promises. You know, he's using... This is important to get. He's using human effort. I'm going to have another example of that in a couple of minutes right here in the middle of chapter 1. He's using human beings. The promises are God's. How they come about sometimes kind of mystifies us, but you're going to find out that God's promises always come about, and they always come about the fulfillment quite literally. He gave them, he said, the lamb's going to go from here to here to here to here. Okay? And he described it, and the peoples that at that point you know, were the, what, squatters uh, on this particular property. Okay? And he said, this is going to be yours. I'm giving it to you. And it came to pass. It took 500 years, which to us goes, wow, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh 
God is not dismayed at all whether the centuries come and go in mankind's chronology or they don't. God is outside of time. If the certainty of his promises, however, are eternal. So you have to kind of keep that in mind a little bit as well. So what you have here then is something uh, that we want to go ahead and start off with. Chapter 1, somebody read the first four verses of the book of Joshua. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even to the, unto the great uh, river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. Okay, that's kind of a partial description. Now that description you're going to find if you compare it to the other descriptions in other parts of scripture is not the complete promised land package. This was a partial fulfillment. That's what it amounts to during uh, Joshua's time uh, that speaks of the complete fulfillment yet to come. So you have uh, a notably less geographical area that God speaks of to Joshua compared to Abraham. Then you get to King David's era and you have an expanded description you know, compared to Joshua's time. And then you've got the kingdom era yet to come when Christ comes and establishes his thousand year reign. And now you have the complete geographical area that matches up to that first geographical description clear back in the book of Genesis. Okay. Because why? Because God's always faithful. God always fulfills his promises. Okay. And he fulfills them completely, not in part. Now, one of the things that we find here uh, when you talk about this, and I'll just set the stage for you here in the first four verses, uh, and there's a couple of other things, but God says, I am going to give this to the Jewish people. Now is the time that you kind of muffed it 40 years ago at Kadesh Barnea, and I hope you've learned your lesson about being obedient and believing my promises, and now we're getting ready to go in to the promised land, and it's my gift to you. Okay, what's the uh, other part of the contract? You got to go in and take it. You got to go fight for it. <laughs> yeah, it's going to take hard work. It's going to take time. It's going to cost you. There's going to have to be a commitment level for you to do this. God says, I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to fulfill it by working through you so that, in effect, you are part of the solution. God is expecting his people to partner with him to get the job done, humanly speaking. Now, let's face it. God spoke the whole place into existence to begin with. It would be no effort for God to speak it out of existence and start over from scratch if he chose to do so. But he does not. He says, I am going to use real people and their real effort and their real sweat and their real faith to bring about the completion of my real promises. That doesn't take anything away from the faithfulness of God. It just says that you and I likewise need to be faithfully committed to what God tells us to do and be obedient. Or we can spiritually wander around in the wilderness for 40 years and croak. Okay? Your option, but that's often what it does. Now, the second thing that I really want to bring out that I find very significant here <coughs> is the terminology used. A simple little word. See, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, okay? He was Moses' minister, aid, uh, okay? And he says, this is what 
God speaks to, to Joshua. Moses, my servant, is dead. And Joshua, you want the job. I just draw your attention. I think it was Tim that read this in verse 10 and following of chapter 34 of the book of Deuteronomy. Okay? This is who Moses was. He was, there arose not a prophet in Israel like unto Moses. He knew God face to face, signs, wonders, sent to the land of Egypt, took care of Pharaoh, did all the servant thing, brought out to the land, mighty hand, great terror. You know, and you said, wow, yeah, Moses is dead. Let's go find a guy like Moses. And God says, I'm looking for a servant. I'm not looking for a mighty prophet. I'm not looking for a miracle worker. I'm not looking for somebody who can call down fire from heaven. I'm not looking for somebody who can, you know, throw, you know, staffs down and pick up snakes and vice versa and turn water into blood and all that other stuff at my command. I'm looking for servant. Great lesson here in general. Uh, for all believers, but especially perhaps for those aspiring to or already in leadership positions. God is not impressed by how big a stick you carry. God is not impressed with how great a miracle you can do or how intellectual you are or how much influence you may have or how many thousands you can control with your rhetoric. God's looking for servants. God says, I'll supply the rest of it. We'll see that in a moment, but I'm looking for servants. Okay? It, uh, uh, somebody go ahead and read verse 5 for us. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Whoa. What's that strike you as? That's God talking. What do you think? Kind of flat, huh? <laughs> not, not, uh, no, no, no suds there, no pizzazz. Kind of like ho hum. How's the weather, bub? I can put a little starch in your spine. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like quite a promise, doesn't it? Yeah. Wow! Look at what God includes in that. Okay. You know, this is the same God that tells us today, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is the same God today that says, I'm going to give you the word that provides everything you possibly need for everything according to life and godliness. This is the same God who says, I'm going to place the third person of the Godhead in you on a permanent basis to empower you to be able to live a victorious Christian life. <coughs> same God. It's just phrased a little different here, isn't it? There shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Wow. And then he says, in case you need a frame of reference, you remember Moses? Yeah. He says, you remember how I was with him? Yeah, that's the same way I'm going to be with you. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty impressive promise. It really is. I mean, this is serious <coughs> stuff. Okay. Okay, now what you have in verse 6, and it's repeated. Okay, by the way, the whole sir, my, Moses, my servant thing, okay, uh, he, he mentions Moses, the servant of God, five times in 15 verses. Five times in 15 verses, the servant of God. You, know, you would think that he would have snuck in miracle worker there someplace if it really was a qualifier. Okay. If a believer, in order to serve God, really needed to be able to call down fire from heaven, raise the dead, walk on water, you'd have thought he'd have put it in here someplace, you know? Didn't do it. He said, I'm just looking for a servant. He said, you got the right heart? Joshua, want the job? He says, the job actually stinks when you think about it. You know, you're going to lead up a nation of almost 2 million people in the middle of nowhere with no ability to provide for themselves outside of divine intervention. And they are a stubborn and stiff-necked and rebellion, just like the church today on this side of the cross. Okay. Yeah. And he said, what I want is a servant. He says, if you're going to lead effectively, you've got to have a servant's heart. It really helps if you carry a big stick. 
okay, and know how to use it, but you'd better have a servant's heart. Okay? Otherwise, you'll be just a totalitarian dictator, and instead of thumping people when they need to be thumped out of love, you're just going to go around knocking heads because you can. And he said, I don't want that. I want a servant. I want somebody that's so tuned to me with their heart that they're going to be obedient and do what I tell them to do. Now, how is it going to be accomplished? Well, it tells you in verse 6, it starts this way. Be strong and of good courage. Talk about repetition, Moses, my servant. Verse 7, be thou strong and very courageous. Verse 9, be strong and of good courage. The old adage, when God begins to repeat something, it is significant enough, maybe we should pay attention. Okay? This is humanly, spiritually, servant-wise, how Joshua needs to respond. Be strong and of good courage. You know, and you've got three things here. Verse 6, I'll just read it. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people... You, shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them? Clear back to Abraham. Okay? He said, I made promises. And through you and your servanthood, I'm going to fulfill those promises to my people and my land. Okay? That's the promise. It, in many ways, is the theme of the entire book of Joshua. Okay? Joshua was an interesting guy. He really was. Okay? Uh, you know, he essentially, well, if you figure he was 20 years old when he was a spy in the promised land, then he was pushing 60, okay, by the time that they got out of the wilderness and crossed the Jordan River. And for most practical purposes, he spent 55 years fighting. He was a tactical genius, humanly speaking. Oh, okay. Admittedly, when you've got God whispering in your ear the night before, it gives you a, an up, it gives you a bit of an advantage on the enemy. Uh, you know, and we'll examine some of those things as we go, but you kind of get the idea. God is promising to this man, uh, this is what I'm going to do, and the whole book of Joshua unfolds. And what you find is, if for all practical purposes, uh, while there are about seven years of main conquest, Joshua spent, for all practical purposes, the rest of his life. Okay? He was 110 when he died. Okay? It, uh, so, you know, start, you can do all the math and figure it out. Okay? He's about 60 when he goes into the promised land and basically he fights the rest of his life. I think one of my professors said he, he figured up 52 years of active you know, resistance to the enemies of God in the promised land. Because there were pockets of resistance and things that went on, and you know, we'll talk about that as we go as well. Somebody read verses 7 and 8. We've seen God's promise. How about the next thing? Verses 7 and 8. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then... Thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Okay. Formula for success. Ready for it? Three parts. Right here. It's called complete dependence upon God's power. But here you have at least three items that should jump out at you. And he starts with that, be strong and very courageous. Okay. And then he goes this way, to observe to do all that's in the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded you, don't turn from the right or the left. If you want to prosper, said, stick your face in the book. Learn what it says and be obedient to it. Now, context. Okay, and, uh, He was talking primarily about the Gospels in the book of Acts, right? 
no we got a a shallow no from the back of the auditorium good no he wasn't he wasn't even talking about isaiah ezekiel and jeremiah was he he's talking about what we call the pentateuch the torah the first five books of our modern bible that's all that had occurred by then those are the ones that moses wrote down okay uh, Moses' life just finished. That's the only, when you talk about the law, you're not talking about any of the other stuff any found anywhere in our Bible. This would have been his world. Okay? So he said, what God is instructing him, he says, if you want to be strong and courageous and be the servant that was going to take the land, then the law has to be a permanent fixture in your life. You need to stick your nose into it, and you need to learn what it says, and then you need to be obedient to it. Second thing you find there is in the, the what, verse 8 or whatever it is. He said, the book of the law will not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate in it night and day. Boy, I don't know about you, but that's a hard one. You know, there's so many interruptions. Now, he's not talking about if you need to change a flat tire, then you need to pay attention to what you're doing or you're going to have to get the car off your foot. Okay? If, the, if you're going to bake a cake, you need to know which ingredients are which and pay attention and not be mo glowing moonbeams, you know, on some meditative cycle. By the way, biblical meditation doesn't have anything to do, you know, with transcendental meditation or the gurus and et cetera. That's another subject. The third thing he says and found in the, the also in verse eight, verse eight, he says, you got to be obedient. You can know it all, study it thoroughly, reflect upon it, meditate about it, pray about it. But if you're not going to be obedient to it, you're going to be a failure. Yeah, that's what he says. It, that's not my quote. That's what he says right here. Okay. End of verse eight is, the, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in the Bible. According in his time, it would have been the first five books. That's all it was, okay? It, uh, so keep it in mind. Somebody read verse 9 for us. I have, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Okay. Okay. You've got in chapters and verse six, you've got God's promise. Okay. In verse seven, you've got and eight, you've got God's power okay. through the Word of God, through the through the Scriptures. In verse nine, you've got the very presence of God. Okay. Notice what He says here. Have I not commanded you? You can keep track of these. All you have to do is look for the three strong and courageous mm -hmm. phrases, and you've got these three things. Okay. Be not afraid. Do not be dismayed. Because you're a really a smart dude and you've spent years in the war college learning how to go to battle against enemy forces, you know, uh, no, no, because why? How can he recognize and assimilate the fact that he doesn't need to be dismayed and, and afraid? This guy's only taking a mixed group of Men, women, kids, old people, young people with no, Jack mentioned this in a different way from a different aspect, with absolutely, for all practical purposes, except for very few brief skirmishes, absolutely no military experience whatsoever. These guys, they haven't been trained as an army. They don't really have any battle experience. It's not like they went down and you know, put everybody in a flanks and fired up their tanks and, and their rocket-propelled grenades and assaulted Pharaoh and his pyramids. They didn't do anything like that. They're just wandering around out there 40 years, dying, having funerals, mm -hmm. wondering if the quail or the manna are going to hold up. You know, I mean, yeah, they don't have any training. They've got no generals, you know, from the classic sense of being trained that way from military expertise. So... You know, a little bit of apprehension about going in and conquering people like the Philistines. Uh, the Hittite Empire was one of the big, you know, uh, empires in that day and age. 
in what you and I would call the promised land? How are we going to handle this? Humanly, there might be just a little bit of apprehension about the whole thing. What does he say? For the Lord thy God is with thee wherever you go. Wow. And you and I have got such a lack of understanding or lack of faith to think somehow that we can't handle what life throws at us. I mean, okay, wrong side of the cross, but what's it say over here? I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, my grace is sufficient in all things, Kathy. Yeah, but he's telling them there is a divine presence. They, his divine presence will be with them, and he knows what they're facing, and he knows they're not capable, mm -hmm. and he's told them three times, be courageous, yeah. you know, and um, don't be afraid, mm -hmm. but I am with, it's, you can only do it with me. Yeah. yeah. And that's how and, it is. And of course, we have no indication found anywhere in Scripture, let alone the book of Joshua, that Joshua ever was indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You got a tough time coming up with something that says that Joshua had the third person of the Godhead personally empowering him to lead a victorious life of a believer. But you and I have that. As believers today on this side of the cross, we have the very presence of God himself on a permanent basis. God tells Joshua, I'm going to give you my presence, not from the inside, but from the outside. Okay? A little different situation, isn't it? I'm just trying to point out the fact that, you know, uh, we look at somebody like Joshua and we say, go get him, tiger. Yeah, whip all those Hittite guys. You know, you can do it. You know how to do it. Uh, we have the same call to be people of faith and obedience and we have God's presence with us. A little different form, okay? But we have God's presence and the promise and the power, they all there, all the P's, they teach you that junk. When you go anyway, it, some of it's actually handy, but you get the idea, okay? It, uh, verses 10 and 11, somebody read those two for us real quick. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals, for within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess it. Okay. The dialogue with God has ceased at this point. Okay. At God's call of Joshua to ministry is in those first nine verses. What does Joshua do? Well, in a nutshell, two things. Uh, that immediately become apparent. One is right here. He sends word out to the people. And especially it says, commanded the officers of the people. So he goes, staff meeting, and the princes and the heads of the different clans, tribes, and stuff come in, and he says, this is what we're going to do, and then they take that information and disseminate it, and then the captains tell the lieutenants, the lieutenants tell the sergeants, and the sergeants run the army anyway, so they tell all the enlisted men. Uh, but you kind of get the idea, okay, what's going on. And this is what he tells them to do. Pass through the host, tell the people, command the people, saying, prepare the food, for three days from now, we're crossing the Jordan and going in. So get your preparations made. Okay, uh, get your preparations made. Okay? That's what he tells them. Okay? It, uh, and then verse twelve down through fifteen, he has a second instruction that is here to the Reubenites, the Gadites, half the tribe of Manasseh. Screech to a halt. Bible quiz, why is Joshua talking to two and a half tribes? What's the distinctive? You can't say. They, they, aren't, <laughs> they aren't going to be going over to live. They're just going over to fight. They're just going over to fight. You see, those two and a half tribes decided that what we call the Sif Jordan. If you're facing Israel this way, Mediterranean over here, 
Okay, and then uh, out of the, you know, coming down, you know, this way from the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River runs down and stops about here at what becomes the Dead Sea. Uh, then this area over here was where they were brought up, okay, to come across the Jordan River. It's in flood stage at that time. We'll talk about that when we get to chapter 2. But what occurs there with this whole geographical location is the two and a half tribes took a look at what we call the Sif Jordan, Okay, it's just a term, a label that comes from, I've forgotten where, okay? Uh, okay, where Transjordan means they transitioned across the Jordan, they transported themselves, okay? So Transjordan would be west of the Jordan River. Sif Jordan would be east. Well, there's some pretty decent farmland out in that part of the world, and those two and a half tribes looked at it and said, you know, we could settle down right here. This is pretty nice. And God said, well, okay. I'm not going to go into all the theology. God said, okay. But you are part of Israel. And I've promised that land to the nation, which means you're going to have to send your fighting men along with the other nine and a half tribes, and you've got to fight until the land is taken before those men can come home. Now, if you really get into it, you find that there was a rotational system uh, where they left some men home to do the crops and to provide protection from the various tribes in the area. So you had, you know, well, I'll put it this way. You had, you know, 40,000 going to fight. You had 20,000 stay home, 20,000 rotated home, and the other 20,000 went to join the, you know, you get the idea, okay? The troop rotation is what it was. It's not too far from the way it is today, is it? Mm, yeah, similar, similar type of military thinking. Yeah, yeah. you're going to rotate fresh troops. In this case, it wasn't so much the fresh troops as it, they were required to fulfill their promise to be part of Israel capturing the promised land. God wouldn't let them out of it. So what you have here uh, is a description. Verse 13, remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, the Lord your God hath given you rest and hath given you this land. Your wives, little ones, cattle remain in the land that Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. He was standing on this side of the Jordan. He was on the east side of the Jordan. What we, again, Sif Jordan. If you have me, you, hear me use that term, you'll know what it is. That, but you will pass before your brethren armed all the mighty men of valor and help them. Okay? Please note something here. You may not have picked it up. Okay? You shall pass before your brethren armed. He just said, you're going to be the tip of the spear. You're going to be the strike force at the head of the army. You're going to be in the front. And that's going to be your position in battle when you go into the promised land. Okay. That's what he said. Sorry, that, you know, or, I'm not sorry. That's what he said, so I'm not sorry at all. It, uh, all right. And all the my, and help them until, verse 15, the Lord has given your brethren rest as he has given you, and they also have possessed the land that your Lord God gave them, then you will return to the land of your possession, enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, that's the fifth use of, of Moses as being a servant, gave you on this side of the Jordan towards the sun rising. Sun rises in where? Egypt. Ah, oh, still does. Even Okay, good. Yeah, it hasn't changed yet. And then you've got 16 through 18 that talks about the support of the people. Kind of goes like this. The people respond to Joshua and they say, all that you've commanded we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. According as we hearken to Moses in all things, we'll hearken unto you. Only the Lord God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever be that doth rebel against your commandment will not hearken to the words and all that you commanded him. He'll be put to death. But we want you to be strong and of good courage. 
In effect, you know what he's saying? He said, we'll follow you, Joshua, if you're the leader that God wants you to be. If you remain true to God's word, if you make the law a permanent fixture in your leadership, if you meditate upon the law constantly, if you are obedient to the teachings of the scriptures, the first five books, that if you do your part, we'll follow you right into hell's door. Yeah. You know, a good leader has that, builds that kind of confidence in his people. He really does. Okay. I, I'm not the only guy, but I, you know, obviously some of you were in the military or whatever. Uh, we had some of our officers that I wouldn't follow to the latrine because I wasn't sure he could get there and back and I didn't want to get lost, okay? But other guys, if they said, okay, up, oh, we're moving, you got up and moved. And there might be a machine gun next up there. You know, there might be punji pits. Uh, you know, there might be, you know, full of, you know, wow, man, when you get into some of the stuff the Chai Coms could throw at you, it could get ugly, okay? But if you trusted your leader, if you trusted the officer in front of you and he was leading you, okay, then you got behind him and you went because he was modeling, he was leading the pack, okay, and he had gained your trust. Not all officers do that, but the people said, you follow God, we'll follow you, but you quit following God you're on your own, pal. We're not going to follow you at all. We're not, you know, it's just, that's the way it goes. I think there's a real good lesson there. You know, leadership, even in a lo at a local church level, leadership needs to be accountable. Primarily, they're accountable, of course, to God and the Word of God. But when they get out of line with what Scripture teaches and what God's heart and desire is, then they need to be jerked up short on a chain. They really do. Okay? Unfortunately, many churches don't know enough about the Word of God to know that we're to jerk on the chain. So that's kind of too bad. But uh, you know. anyway, uh, good place to stop. End of chapter one. Thoughts, comments. Yes, sir. I was sir. thinking about General George Patton in World War II as a leader. He wasn't. He wasn't the nicest guy in the world, but he got mm. the job done. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't. I, you know, in all honesty, we don't know a whole lot about the personality of Joshua. We know some of his character traits, some of which are outlined right here in chapter one, are indicated. You know, and you know, obviously, God was looking for a servant, so he probably had humility. He probably you know, uh, had a willing heart. He probably had some other characteristics as long with good courage, you know, good common sense and so forth. But, you know, his personality, being human, probably had some rough edges to it that some people probably didn't appreciate. Okay? Uh, that didn't disqualify him from leadership. You know, he might not have been the guy you invited over to play pinot. You know, but if you wanted to go wipe out the Aites or the people inside of Jericho, well, he's God's man for the job. So, you know, different things. Others? Thoughts? Good and firm commands that he gave of how he spread his word out. I mean, there wasn't any. What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah not a lot of uh, questionable middle ground there, was there? Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, it's not like God, you know, when eeny, meeny, miny, mo, you come over here, I want to talk to you. I mean, he's given him this command to go in and take the land, and I'll be with you. But this is the guy that 40 years earlier said, let's go. We can do it. God's mm -hmm. with us. Yeah, even so he, then. He's got a track record. He spent the 40 days mm -hmm. on the side of the mountain. So. Well, the other thing, too, when you stop from a human perspective, this guy has spent 40 years dogging Moses around through the wilderness, getting, you know, picking his brain and watching his leadership of the, of the nation. And we find that Joshua was 
clear back on the mountain and he must have had a relationship even then he was willing to put himself under the discipleship of Moses for all those years to gain everything he could. I don't think he necessarily had the ambition of being the man following Moses, but he was willing to be trained so that he could serve in whatever capacity God chose him to serve in. Happened to be a pretty distinguished one. If he wanted to be the man, he wouldn't have performed that. Exactly, good point. Yeah, he wouldn't have had the right humility to be able to do the office. Yeah. Then again, the Israelites, like most large groups of people, some people can be led and some people have to be pushed. Yeah, well, what you had is a 10 to 2 40 years before. It's because Joshua said, if God's leading us into the promised land, we need to follow him. The other people, you couldn't push them hard enough to get them across the beachhead. So, yeah, again, just some different observations. So. They've had 40 years to think about it. And they had 40 years as they attended fu funeral to, after funeral after funeral. Maybe we ought to follow Joshua and Caleb. Yeah, maybe if we get another chance, or maybe if nothing else, we better teach the kids that, hey, don't mess with this not following God. You know, if, if when he does take everybody in the, the nation into the land, maybe we ought to just go ahead and say, yeah, let's go like we should have done 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, all right. Father, thank you. As we bow before you, amazing book as we initiate a journey uh, through what effectively is the rest of the life of Joshua, uh, much of which has to do with the conquest of the land. And then there's uh, some other fascinating uh, events uh, and understandings that flow from the book. We thank you, Lord, that this was a faithful man a man who desired to serve, a man who had committed himself to learning what he could, to being mentored, to be able to uh, recognize your presence, and then was willing to step into a role of just serving the Most High God, not one necessarily of human prestige, one that had all kinds of, oh, wow, different events and struggles, uh, that was within his lifetime of serving, but yet, Lord, one that is recorded in your scripture as an example that we can learn so much from. So we thank you as this journey begins in Christ's name. Amen.